these beings will be specially mentioned further on. May it suffice for the moment to say that they possess superhuman wisdom and power. They now isolated a small group out of Lemurian mankind and designated these to be the ancestors of the coming Atlantean race. The place where they did this was situated in the tropical zone. Under there. Direction the men of this group had been trained in the control of the natural forces. They were very strong, and knew how to win the most diverse treasures from the earth. They could cultivate the fields and use their fruits for their subsistence. They had become characters of strong will through the discipline to which they had been subjected. Their souls and hearts were developed only in small measure. On the other hand, these had been developed among the women. Memory and fantasy and everything connected with them were to be found among the latter. The above mentioned leaders caused the group to divide itself into smaller groups. They put the women in charge of ordering and establishing these groups. Through her memory, woman had acquired the capacity to make the experiences and adventures of the past useful for the future. What had proved helpful yesterday she used today and realized that it would also be useful tomorrow. The institution for communal life therefore emanated from her. Under her influence the concepts of good and evil developed. Through her thoughtful life she had acquired an understanding for nature. Out of the observation of nature, those ideas developed in her according to which she directed the actions of men. The leaders had arranged things in such a way that through the soul of woman, the willful nature, the vigorous strength of man were ennobled and refined. Of course one must represent all this to oneself as childish beginnings. The words of our language all too easily call up ideas which are taken from the life of the present. By way of the awakened soul life of the women the leaders first developed the soul life of the men. In the colony we have described, the influence of the women was therefore very great. One had to go to them for advice when one wanted to interpret the signs of nature. The whole manner of their soul life, however, was still dominated by the hidden human soul forces. One does not describe the matter quite exactly, but fairly closely, if one speaks of a somnambulistic contemplating among these women. In certain higher dreams, the secrets of nature were divulged to them and they received the impulses for their actions. Everything was animated for them and showed itself to them in soul powers and apparitions. They abandoned themselves to the mysterious weaving of their soul forces. That which impelled them to their actions were inner voices, or what plants, animals, stones, wind and clouds, the whispering of the trees, and so on, told them. From this state of soul originated that which one can call human religion. The spiritual in nature and in human life gradually came to be venerated and worshipped. Some women attained a special preeminence because out of special mysterious depths they could interpret what the world contained. Thus it could come to pass among such women that that which lived within them could transpose itself into a kind of natural language. For the beginning of language lies in something which is similar to song. The energy of thought was transformed into audible sound. The inner rhythm of nature sounded from the lips of wise women. One gathered around such women and in their song-like sentences felt the utterances of higher power. Human worship of the gods began with such things. For that period there can be no question of sense. 
in that which was spoken. Sound, tone, and rhythm were perceived. One did not imagine anything along with these, but absorbed in the soul the power of what was heard. The whole process was under the direction of the higher leader. They had inspired the wise priestesses with tones and rhythms in a manner which cannot now be further discussed. Thus they could have an ennobling effect on the souls of men. One can say that in this way the true life of the soul first awakened. In this realm, beautiful scenes are shown by the Akasha Chronicles. One of these will be described. We are in a forest, near a mighty tree. The sun has just risen in the east. The palm-like tree, from around which the other trees have been removed, cast mighty shadows. The priestess, her face turned to the east, ecstatic, sits on a seat made of rare natural objects and plants. Slowly in rhythmical sequence, a few strange, constantly repeated sounds stream from her lips. A number of men and women are sitting in circles around her, their faces lost in dreams, absorbing inner life from what they hear. Other scenes too can be seen. At a similarly arranged place of priestess, things, in a similar manner, that her tones have in them something mightier, more powerful. Those around her move in rhythmic dances, for this was the other way in which soul entered into mankind. The mysterious rhythms which one had heard from nature were imitated by the movements of the limbs. One thereby felt at one with nature and with the powers acting in her. The place on earth in which this stock of a coming race of men was developed was especially suited for this purpose. It was one where the then still turbulent earth had become fairly calm. For Lemuria was turbulent. After all, the earth at that time did not yet have its later density. The thin ground was everywhere undermined by volcanic forces which broke forth in smaller or larger streams. Mighty volcanoes existed almost everywhere and developed a continuous destructive activity. Men were accustomed to reckoning with this fiery activity in everything they did. They also used this fire in their labors and contrivances. Their occupations were often such that the fire of nature served as a basis for them in the same way as artificial fire did in human labor today. It was through the activity of this volcanic fire that the destruction of the Lemurian land came about. While the part of Lemuria from which the parent race of the Atlanteans was to develop had a hot climate, it was by and large free of volcanic activity. Human nature could unfold more calmly and peacefully here than in the other regions of the Earth. The more nomadic life of former times was abandoned, and fixed settlements became more and more numerous. One must represent to oneself that at that time the human body still had very malleable and pliant qualities. This body still changed form whenever the inner life changed. Not long before, men had still been quite diverse as regards their external form. At that time the external influence of region and climate were still decisive in respect to their form. Only in the colony described did the body of man increasingly become an expression of his inner soul life. Moreover, this colony had an advanced externally more nobly formed race of men. One must say that through the things which they had done, the leaders had really first created what is. The true human form, this occurred quite slowly and gradually. 
it happened in such a way that the soul life of man was first developed and that the still soft and malleable body adapted itself to this. It is a law in the development of mankind that, as progress continues, man has less and less of a molding influence on his physical body. This physical human body in fact received a fairly unchanging form only with the development of the faculty of reason and with the hardening of the rock, mineral, and metal formations of earth connected with this development. For in the Lemurian and even in the Atlantean period, stones and metals were much softer than later. This is not contradicted by the fact that there exist descendants of the last Lemurians and Atlanteans who today exhibit forms as fixed as the human races which were formed later. These remnants had to adapt themselves to the changed environmental conditions of Earth and thus became more rigid. Just this is the reason for their decline. They did not transform themselves from within, instead, their less developed interior was forced into rigidity from the outside and thus compelled to stagnation. This stagnation is really a regression, for the inner life, too, has degenerated because it could not fulfill itself within the rigid external bodily structure. Animal life was subject to even greater changeability. We shall speak further about the animal species existing at the time of the development of man and about their origin, as well as about the development of new animal forms after man already existed. Here we shall say only that the existing animal species continually transformed themselves and that new ones were developing. This transformation was of course a gradual one. The reasons for the transformation lay in part in a change of habitat and of the manner of life. The animals had a capacity of extraordinarily rapid adaptation to new conditions. The malleable body changed its organs comparatively rapidly, so that after a more or less brief period the descendants of a particular animal species resembled their ancestors only slightly. The same was the case in even greater measure for the plant. The greatest influence on the transformation of men and animals was exercised by man himself. This was true whether he instinctively brought organisms into such an environment that they assumed certain forms, or whether he achieved this by experiments in breeding. The transforming influence of man on nature was immeasurably great at that time, compared with the conditions of today. This was especially the case in the colony we have described. For there the leaders directed this transformation in a way of which men were not conscious. This was the case to such a degree that when men left the colony in order to found the different Atlantean races, they could take with them a highly developed knowledge of the breeding of animals and plants. The labor of cultivation in Atlantis was then essentially a consequence of the knowledge thus brought along. But here again it must be emphasized that this knowledge had an instinctive character. In this state essentially it remained among the first Atlantean races. The preeminence of the feminine soul, which has been described, was especially strong in the last Lemurian period and continued into the Atlantean times, during which the fourth subrace was preparing itself. But one must not imagine that this was the case among all of mankind. It was true, however, for that part of the population of Earth from which the truly advanced races later emerged. This influence exercised the strongest effect upon all that which in man is unconscious. The development of certain constant gestures, 
the refinements of sensory perception, the feeling for beauty, a good part of the general life of sensations and feelings which is common to all men. All this originally emanated from the spiritual influence of woman. It is not an overstatement if one interprets the reports in such a way as to affirm. The civilized nations have a bodily form and expression, as well as certain bases of physical soul life, which were imprinted upon them by woman. In the next chapter we shall go back to earlier periods of the development of mankind, during which the population of Earth still belonged to only one sex. The development of the two sexes will then be described. 6. The division into sexes Much of the human form in those ancient times described in the preceding chapters differed from the form of present-day man. One comes to conditions still more dissimilar if one goes even further back in the history of mankind. For only in the course of time did the forms of man and woman develop from an older, basic form in which human beings were neither the one nor the other, but rather were both at once. He who wants to form an idea of these enormously distant periods of the past must however liberate himself completely from the habitual conceptions taken from what man sees around him. The times into which we now look back lie somewhat before the middle of the epic which in the preceding passages was designated as the Lemurian. At that time the human body still consisted of soft and malleable material. The other forms of Earth also were still soft and malleable. As opposed to its later hardened condition, Earth was still in a welling, more fluid one. As the human animal at that time embodied itself in matter, it could adapt this matter to itself in a much greater degree than later. That the soul takes on a male or a female body is due to the fact that the development of external terrestrial nature forces the one or the other upon it. While the material substances had not yet become rigid, the soul could force these substances to obey its own laws. It made of the body an impression of its own nature. But when became denser the soul had to submit to the laws impressed upon this matter by external terrestrial nature. As long as the soul could still control matter, it formed its body as neither male nor female, but instead gave its qualities which embraced both at the same time. For the soul is simultaneously male and female. It carries these two natures in itself, its male element is related to what is called will, its female element to what is called imagination. The external formation of Earth resulted in that the body assumed the one-sided form has ill body has ill body has ill body has taken a form which is conditioned by the element of will. The female body on the other hand bears the stamp of imagination. Thus it comes about that the two sex, male female soul inhabits a single sex, male or female body. In the course of development the body had taken a form determined by the external terrestrial forces, so that it was no longer possible for the soul to pour its whole inner energy into this body. The soul had to retain something of this energy within itself and could let only a part of it flow into the body. If one continues with the Akasha Chronicle, the following becomes apparent. In an ancient period, human forms appear for us which are soft, malleable and quite different from later ones. They still carry the nature of man and woman within themselves to an equal degree. In the course of time, the material substances become denser. The human body appears in two forms, one of which begins to resemble the subsequent shape of man, the other that of woman. When this 
different had not yet agreed with every human being to produce another human being out of himself. Impregnation was not an external process, it was something which took place inside the human body itself. By becoming male or female, the body lost this possibility of self-impregnation. It had to act together with another body in order to produce a new human being. The division into sexes takes place when the earth enters a certain stage of its densification. Density of the division into sexes is one continuous with the cosmic chronicle. The following becomes apparent. In an ancient period, human forms appear before us with their thoughts, malleable and quite different from later ones. They still carry the nature of man and woman within themselves to an equal degree. In the course of time, the material substances become denser. The human body appears in two forms, one of which begins to resemble the subsequent state of man, the other that of woman. When this difference had not yet appeared, every human being could produce another human being out of himself. Impregnation was not an external process, it was something which took place inside the human body itself. By becoming male or female, the body lost its possibility of self-impregnation. It had to act together with another body in order to produce a new human being. The division into sexes takes place when the earth enters a certain stage of its densification. Density of matter inhibits a portion of the force of reproduction. That portion of this force which is still active means an external complementation through the opposite force of another human being. The soul, however, must retain a portion of its earlier energy within itself, in man as well as in woman. It cannot use this portion in the physical external world. This portion of energy is now directed toward the interior of man. It cannot emerge toward the exterior, therefore it is free for inner organs. Here an important point in the development of mankind is here. Previously that which is called spirit, the faculty of thought, did not find a place in man. For this faculty we have found no organ for exercising its function. The soul had employed all its energy toward the exterior in order to build up the body. But now the energy of the soul, which finds no external employment, can become associated with the spiritual energy and is able to associate with those organs of developing the body which later make of man a thinking being. Thus man could move a portion of the energy of the previous human soul for the production of beings like himself in order to perfect his own nature. The force by which man has been the leading brain for itself is the same by which man has been the leading brain for The type of thought is seen as that by no longer impregnating themselves, but rather by impregnating themselves, human beings can become a part of their productive energy within and so become thinking creatures. Thus the male and the female body each represent an imperfect external embodiment of the soul, but thereby they become more perfect in order. This transformation of man takes place very slowly and gradually. Little by little, the younger, single-sex male or female forms appear beside the old double-sex one. It is again a kind of fertilization which takes place in man when he becomes a creature endowed with spirit. The inner organs which can be built up by the surplus soul energy are fructified by the spirit. In itself, the soul is inside it, male, female. In ancient times, it also formed its body on this basis. Later, it can form its body only in such a way that the external it acts together with another body, thereby the soul itself is 